Welcome to another Down the Rabbit Hole video, and welcome to another Star Frontiers video, and welcome to the Great Frontier itself, space. What we're looking at here is the hex map that is used when you're doing spaceship combat in Star Frontiers. Um, somebody had made a comment when I did my video about how you actually do regular old uh, run and gun gameplay in Star Frontiers. Somebody had said, hey, can you maybe do one about the spaceship rules? Because I don't really understand that. And I thought, okay. I never really did much in the way of the space combat, and I'm going to describe why. Now, I'm going to do a very short scenario here, but this video might be kind of long because I want to go into what was really good about Star Frontiers space combat and what was really bad about it. Again, I'm not trying to be uh, trolly or clickbaity. I know people don't like my Volturnus video, but this is just something that I observed when I was trying to wrap my head around what's it like to do space combat in Star Frontiers. Now, um, most people know Star Frontiers space combat from this, the Nighthawks campaign book, and this goes into really good detail about how spaceships work, what um, your, sh your characters do aboard them, that kind of thing. But uh, anybody who might be picking this thing up thinking this is where the uh, description and the details are of how you do spaceship combat, you're in for a surprise because that's not really the book for it. This other one is the UPF, um, United Planetary Federation, very original name, uh, Tactical Operations Manual. This is the one you want because this one came with the Nighthawks box set. Uh, but this is the one that um, details how you actually do spaceship combat. It gives you the details of um, how movement works with the ships, uh, where combat can occur, you know, range, uh, firing your, uh, your different uh, weapons. This is where all the combat is detailed. So uh, it's no wonder people have said, hey, I don't understand it. That's because you may not have this book, the Tactical Operations Manual. You might have only picked up the campaign book. And as awesome as this is, this is a really nice resource. It has a lot of good material in it. It's more about um, how you fly the ship, uh, what kinds of um, systems are on board, escape pods, that kind of thing. All about uh, spaceship movement, travel, all the spaceship skills. That's great for your characters inside the spaceship, but if you just want to have your ships flying around shooting each other, this is the book that you need. And this is what we're going to largely use. Now, I'm going to just take a few pauses and describe my small issue with the way this was all set up. In that, when you've got it in your mind, hey, I'm going to play Star Frontiers, and look at that cover. Yeah, that's me and my buddies in our assault scouts attacking some frigate on the, the far reaches of the frontier. Perhaps they're space pirates. Who knows what's going on there? Doesn't that look dynamic and exciting? Yes, very true. Except this tactical operations manual set of rules was really more designed as like a kind of a basic, almost uh, um, like tin soldiers moving around on a board kind of a, a system. And not that I'm, you know, I don't want to be insulting about it, but what that means is if you've got uh, visions in your mind, like I did, of hopping aboard my ship and doing some of this great combat that you're seeing here, like, look at these awesome pieces of artwork, you know, here I am in command of my starship, let's take on the Sathar. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the actual rules here are very, very rudimentary, and that's fine, except for it means that there's a very good chance that your awesome spaceship that is probably worth millions, if not billions of credits, could quite easily just get wiped out very quickly and very easily. Because again, this is designed with, you know, lots of different ships having a big combat in the arena of space going on. And if you've got any kind of precious connection to your starship, kind of like Kirk with the Enterprise or Han Solo with the Millennium Falcon, uh, you might want to just give up on that because your ship will probably get destroyed real quick using these rules. So uh, let me just get set up now. I want to talk a little bit about what is so awesome about these rules compared to what you might get in a Star Trek or Star Wars online, uh, or sorry, pen and paper, move your figures around and have a spaceship battle kind of a thing.
Okay, here we are in the vast reaches of space, and we're using a very large hex grid. Uh, the reason being this is nice for, as, as anybody who plays a lot of these tactical board games where you're moving figures around, uh, hexagons are a heck of a lot easier to work with than squares because they almost are easier for covering circular movement, that kind of thing, which is definitely going to be the case here in space. Each of the hexagons that are used on this grid is 10,000 kilometers across. That's really big. The planet Earth would fill one hexagon. It's a vast, vast area of space. And I will never forget uh, the first time in my campaign we finally got ourselves aboard a spaceship and uh, John, the um, pilot of the group, was like, all right, let's blast off and get out of here. I'm like, yeah, sure, sounds great. Maximum acceleration. Woohoo! Okay, off into space. And off we went, and I showed him this grid. I was like, okay, here is the planet that you are leaving. Here is your spaceship. And off you go. Let's see what happens when you hit... Now, he thought there was a warp drive, which there isn't, and I'll describe what Star Frontiers came up to came up with as an alternative to warp drive or hyperspace. Um, but we'll get to that in a sec. He uh, thought to himself, right, let's take off because we got, you know, bad guys chasing us from this planet. Let's go. And I said, great. Okay, so you blast off. You're in space. And after 10 minutes, 10 minutes of full acceleration, you want to know how far you get? Sure, okay. That far. Yes. In 10 minutes, their ship managed to go one entire hexagon. And that just seemed like, wait a minute, uh, that kind of scales down my level of expectations. 10 minutes? Probably shorter than the length of this video is going to be? Yeah. In 10 whole minutes, your ship has gone one hex. That seems crazy. But then again, remember, one hex is 10,000 kilometers. The Earth could fit inside one of these hexes. So what I really like with this rule set, with Star Frontiers, it took a very hard-nosed scientific approach to things. None of this, you know, just leaping on your ship and having a big spaceship battle and everything is close by. We'll get to that as well. No, uh, it was very, very narrowed down or nailed down into science and this is how far this is how big space is so i'll just sort of pull you back out you know we're talking about a map that's absolutely huge here and that's the the kind of scale i was really blown away when i was kind of getting into astronomy a lot as you know anybody who's into science fiction you, you also want to find out what's real space like and what really amazed me was I then found out, okay, well, let's let's do a comparison here. Um, if that's how big this particular scenario is, if the Earth would fill one of these hexagons, how big is a big planet like Jupiter? Well, Jupiter is 139,000 kilometers, or basically 14 of these hexagons. Yeah, that's how big Jupiter is. So you really start to get a, an idea, an, an appreciation, at least in my case, of just how massive space can be. It's huge. Now, we're not going to be dealing with, with Jupiter. There will be no uh, Jovian gas giants here. Let me just remove that out of the way. But I wanted to give you an idea of the scale we're talking about. So when I, um, when I explained, yeah, okay, in 10 minutes, there's how far you guys have traveled, I think it started to sink in. Uh, space is kind of big. And I really like that. I love that about Star Frontiers. I also love, and we're going to go into some of the details here, how the spaceships used a very non-high-tech approach to stuff. Like, they had in them, sure, there were laser beams and you know, torpedoes, and we'll talk about those in a second, but there were also these, like, ideas that were kind of crazy and rudimentary, and yet locked down in science. Here's an idea of some of the ships involved. I really like the agricultural ship there because the design is very much based on science. Uh, however, when we get into the basic game for Nighthawks, which is you know, what they call spaceship combat, 
um, the, they kind of then threw that out the window and they started dealing with it. Like for example, the spaceship movement here, you can see that it's, it's actually not very realistic. You would basically, you have the ability to move forward, but if you turn, they talk about maneuver rating. And what that means is that's how many times you can actually turn the ship. Is it there? Yes. Turning. Each ship has a maneuver rating, MR. It'll be a number of, you know, one to five or six, whatever. Um, in this example, we've got a frigate here that has moved seven hexes, hexes, but it has a maneuver rating of three, which means it can go forward, then turn once, then turn uh, a second time. So that's, that's the way that ships move with the idea of you're just moving these little pieces around this board. That's not the way spaceships would actually work if you were to... Uh, turn around, you could just, you know, rotate yourself 180 degrees, not hit any thrusters, and you would be facing backwards, but still moving in that direction. So there is this weird kind of marriage of, okay, you've got things nicely uh, settled in a realistic uh, fashion, but then when you go to doing this uh, tactical operations manual, where the basic rules are we're about to do, uh, you suddenly throw all that out the window. And the other thing is, now this is going to be a little bit tricky here, but all of these ships, which look so impressive, are actually very, they have very few hit points, like this frigate. Uh, let's let's start off, okay, there's a fighter, which, uh, you know, we're talking sort of, uh, I don't know, top gun, uh, you know, type of aircraft sort of size there. Then the Assault Scout, which is, you know, much bigger. And I always sort of peg the Assault Scout. That's the one that's used in most artwork for Nighthawks. That is Star Frontier's version of, like, the Millennium Falcon. Then the Frigate, which is much, much larger, and the Destroyer are, are in there. But the weird thing is the Assault Scout and the Frigate and Destroyer don't have a lot of hull points or, you know, their version of hit points. Um, if we go to the uh, rules here, you can see... An Assault Scout only has 15 hit points, and we're using these uh, die 10 to determine some of our damage. So very quickly, if, if I was to roll, if, if, if an Assault Scout got hit by something that happens to roll 2 die 10 for its damage, and I was to roll, okay, well that's only 8 points, but suddenly our Assault Scout in one shot has gone down to 50% of its hull integrity and might break apart. Uh, this game is is a really weird sort of combination of sometimes it's for the sake of moving pieces along and getting the uh, combat really, really quickly moving. And then other times you've got these ideas that it's this you know big, expansive uh, combat thing. Uh, what I mean to say is that, okay, let's continue with the Millennium Falcon idea using the Assault Scout there. You're thinking to yourself, that's your, your Han Solo type ship. You think to yourself, okay, this thing is probably not cheap to acquire. And you've managed to work your career up so that you can actually fly this thing. And it only has 15 hull points. One shot, very similar to what I just did, possibly two, is going to destroy it entirely. That's, um, that's not going to lend itself well to the kind of adventure and combat that the pictures are kind of displaying. It's very, very strange, but uh, that's basically what these rules were originally laid out like. I'm not a huge fan of them for that reason. I think a lot of fans have actually modified the rule set to make it a little more cinematic, a little more the kind of thing that uh, you think of when you see science fiction spaceship battles, or just looking at, you know, some of the art, some of the, the pictures and the artwork that's in these books. like. It, it seems to cry out, oh, it's going to be this great big sprawling adventure with these ships that are all involved in big combat and that kind of thing. And then when you actually get to the scenario, it's like, no, 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 your ship can get wiped out pretty quick. I, I wasn't too thrilled with that part of Nighthawks, and uh, that's probably why our campaign only ever really dealt with it once. However... I've kind of dallied about a lot with uh, what's going on. Oh, before I um, before we actually do a bit of combat, one nice bit of hard science that I wanted to discuss, because it's probably going to come up in the combat we're about to ensue. Uh, where is it here? The masking screen is one of the defense items, and it's actually really, really cool. Where did it go? So here we have on page six some of the description of the terms that we're going to be encountering during this combat. 
Uh, some of the weapons that we encounter are forward firing, which means they can only shoot directly ahead of the ship. Uh, some of them are moving player only. Some of them have range diffusion, which we'll talk about, and some are limited. But what I really like is the defensive systems. Now, reflective hull, practically all ships have got that. And if you've seen any ship that has a very mirrored surface, that's basically what that is. It's, uh, it allows lasers to bounce off. It gives a bit of uh, protection against them. But what I really like is the masking screen. The idea behind the masking screen says here, it's created when a ship releases a cloud of water vapor into space. The vapor crystallizes and forms a protective cloud surrounding the ship. Besides making the ship more difficult to hit, a masking screen absorbs energy from a laser. Which kind of, I like that idea. Like as the light beam from the laser strikes the ship, it would be deflected by this crystalline covering that's going over the entire ship. The amount of damage that is rolled is divided in half, which is really, really cool. The masking screen has exactly the same effect on laser fired out of the screen as it does on the laser fired into the screen. And it doesn't say it in this part of the book, but I did look it up. The other very weird thing is if your ship has got this, this active masking screen, this, this crystalline icy thing around you, it means that you can't change your direction. Uh, if your ship is suddenly surrounded by this icicle stuff and you wanted to turn around, you're going to smash through the floating glass structure that's surrounding your ship. So that's, that's a neat thing that you don't really see in Star Trek or anything. And in fact, that's why for the um, character sheet, if you will, that the spaceships carry, where is it over here? We keep track of things, like in the defenses section, we have little boxes to keep track of how many masking screens have we used up? How many times have we fired the, the water buckets out onto the uh, surrounding the ship so that we could then uh, deflect any lasers that are coming in? It's a really, really cool level of science. And that's, that's uh, throughout many of the bits of the Nighthawks rules. Anyway, uh, this, this video is going to get very long. So let me set up... Uh, what we're going to do is a little bit of a compromise. I was going to just do, in Tactical Operations Manual, the basic scenario of the basic game. But I thought to myself, no, 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 that might be a little too quick. So what we're going to do is take, let me just find the right page here. Uh, we're going to take one of their scenarios that they recommend. And this is just to answer the original question of how does this stuff work. We're going to do the basic game scenario of number one, surprise attack. These ships are going to be attacked by these ships. But I'm going to actually use the advanced rules just to make it a little fleshed out. And I think most people who are going to watch this video are going to think, okay, I'm, I'm here for the advanced rules, so please show those. So let's read it out here. A pair of UPF ships, United Planetary Federation, uh, the frigate Zagata and the Assault Scout Stiletto have been dispatched to guard the small space station Dolin Bay in orbit around the planet Kenza Kit. In the second week of this routine duty, the Dolin Bay's powerful sensor detect a pair of ships entering the system from the void. As they streak closer, we'll talk about the void later, as they streak closer, the computer sketches the sleek outlines of a Sathar heavy cruiser and its destroyer escort. The UPF crews, facing a far stronger enemy, realize they must flee, but they cannot leave the Dolan Bay garrison defenseless against the invaders. Now again, there are other parts of this description, but what we're going to do is have the UPF take on the Sathar in this space combat situation, but we're going to use the advanced rules. All right, so here is our scenario all set up with a few slight alterations for brevity. Uh, here is Dolan Station. We've got our Assault Scout Stiletto. We've got our Frigate Zagata, and they're going to go and take on the Sathar. This is actually the first time the Sathar have appeared in my videos. Uh, the original scenario wrote up, written up in the book mentioned that um, one of the ships is a destroyer and the other one is a heavy cruiser. But I was going, when I was preparing to make this battle, I thought uh, the heavy cruiser could pretty much wipe the floor with these forces. So let's just make them both destroyers just to keep things kind of balanced. Um, and much like when I did the running gun version of how you do Star Frontiers uh, with your characters running around in the uh, on the desert planet, 
I'm going to have it so that everybody's level is level 3, and in this case, for movement, everybody is starting at a speed of 5, which means they can move through 5 of these hexes in a 10 minute turn. That seems nice and basic and easy and simple for this tin soldiers moving around a battlefield type of a game, which is what the, um, the foundation of the Nighthawk rules is. But then again, think about it. 50,000 kilometers in 10 minutes. That's an incredibly fast speed. And although we're using counters here and we're, we're seeing each other, in all the movies where you've got uh, ships fighting against each other with their lasers, etc., they can all see each other. A hex that's 10,000 kilometers where an entire planet can fit inside, even if these guys were to occupy the same space, there's no way in heck they would see each other out the window. We have to remember this probably was kind of like submarine combat and it was all done with, you know, radar and ships uh, or, or instrumentation telling them where everybody was. Uh, so that's kind of a neat thing. Oh, and the other thing that I wanted to discuss before we get started. So these guys can increase or decrease their speed with something called the ADF, the acceleration deceleration factor. Uh, in the case of the um, frigate, he can increase or decrease his speed by three and the uh, Assault Scout can increase or decrease his speed by 5. So these guys are both moving 5 right now. He could either slow down to 2 or he could speed up to 8 hexes that he can move. The Assault Scout could go from uh, a movement of 5, he could go all the way up to 10 if he wants, or he could go down to 0. What's interesting though is that I did the math on this uh, when I was sort of doing my campaign back in the day. If you were to actually increase your speed, let's say you only did uh, this guy who's currently moving at five, if he wants to increase his speed just one factor, so he's going at a speed of six little hexes, the acceleration that would be going on for the crew on board that frigate would be the equivalent of three Gs of force. They would get, maybe that wouldn't be enough for them to lose consciousness, but they would be not able to just have a stroll down the hallway. And that's only with an ADF of 1 being used. If this guy wanted to use 5, that would be 15 Gs. That's ridiculous. So in my uh, house rules, I actually made up this thing called the uh, Grav Dig Absorber, which is not new as Star Trek has it. I think they call it the inertial dampeners. Um, basically, it's to stop the crew from being turned into jam on the walls. Uh, I made it so that it would reduce it down to 1G for 1 ADF. So if this guy does pull 5 ADFs and increases his speed from 5 to 10, he's actually just going to pull 5Gs for his crew on board. Uh, this is the level of detail that I went into. Um, and one other thing before we get started. There is technically no maximum speed that these ships can go. They're currently at 5. If this guy wanted to really hit the accelerator and keep going and going and going, constantly adding 5 to his speed, so he'd go 5, 10, and then 15, 20, 25, 30. Like, if he wanted to do that, nothing's stopping him, now that we know gravity or, you know, inertial dampers aren't going to turn the crew into jam. But secondly, he's going to hit this theoretical maximum in the campaign rules. Now, we'll go back to the, uh, the campaign book here. In the introduction, it talks about interstellar travel. And right down here, it mentions that the discovery that allowed members of the four races to expand beyond their home worlds and enter the frontier was purely accidental. It occurred when spaceships were developed that could accelerate to a speed of about 12 million kilometers per hour, 1% the speed of light. I did the math. 12 million kilometers per hour is 200 hexes per turn. And again, we're talking this thing happens in a speed of like 10 minute increments. So this guy, as he's coasting along at a speed of 5, in 10 minutes he's covering 50,000 kilometers at his speed of 5. If he was to continue to accelerate and next turn go 10 and the turn after that go 15, if he was to reach after 33 hours of accelerating, if he reached a speed of 200, he would actually do this thing called entering the void, where he would vanish from our space and reappear in another star system. That was the rule set that they came up with, and I thought that was a really cool idea. It meant, though, that I had to kind of put my head together of like, okay, well, how long does it take to reach a speed of 200? 33 hours. Oh, okay. So you've got a couple of days of travel going on. But you know what? We're not here to talk about the um, the use of the void or the impact that it had on the crew on board. We're here to fight. Let's get on with it. 
So, I've written up our characters, or our ships, on uh, the included roster sheet. We have we have UPFS Zagata, that's our frigate. We have UPFS Stiletto, that's our assault scout. And since there wasn't room, I just put and Nolan Bay Space Station's just going to sit down here because he's not moving much. You've got his weapons and all that stuff figured out. But I've just sort of tacked him onto the bottom. Over here with our two Seth are destroyers, since the light cruiser was just way too... Sorry, heavy cruiser was way too powerful. Our two destroyers, we've got the SAV Venomous up here. That's uh, got a little number A in the corner. And we also have, where did he go? Was he there? Uh, he's there now. Uh, SAV Perdition, which is destroyer number B. They're all moving at a speed of five. We have the different weapons detailed here, which I will go into later, but we've got a laser cannon, rocket batteries, torpedoes, etc. And these guys have also got similar things to each other. We have our defenses. Everybody's got a reflective hull, so that'll make that easy. These three ships each have a masking screen, which is that crystalline thing that they can uh, put up around themselves. Uh, the Assault Scout, because he's just a little flying, sort of Millennium Falcon-esque uh, ship, he does not have the capability of a masking screen. But he can evade. However, let's, uh, let's get on with it here. So, uh, somebody mentioned when I did my run-and-gun version, how to do it on the um, desert planet, the initial rule set that I used was like, okay, you roll for one side to determine who goes first, you roll for the other side, etc. Whoever has the highest number is actually who goes first, and then I kept it that way throughout the entire scenario. Somebody said, you know, it says in the rules, you do that every turn. So, for the first round, you've got side A, side B, they do their move, they do their shoots, then you roll initiative again. That's up for debate, different rule books. I mean, especially in Dungeons and Dragons, I think it was just you roll once and that's it for the whole scenario. But I'm going to, for this thing, for the Nighthawks combat, I will roll every round. So it'll be, unlike my last one, I will actually roll initiative each turn. Because everybody's the same level and there's no other weird modifiers, it's just going to be the roll of the dice as to who goes first. Okay, so let's do that. We will have initiative to determine who is player A and who is player B. Player A will actually move first and player B will shoot first. So it's a kind of a losing scenario in a way, but regardless. Red for the Sathar, green for the UPF. Who goes first? Seven for the Sathar. They are player A in this first round. So they move first and the UPF will shoot first. Now that we have determined who goes first, these are the basic rules, but this, the advanced rules kind of just add a few elements of, like, seeker missiles and that. Player A, the Sathar, they announce which of their ships are using masking screens. Remember the crystalline thing? These guys have got them. Uh, they're going to hold off just for now, because they might overshoot their targets. Um, a masking screen counter will be placed on top of them. Not needed. Spa uh, ships and space stations in orbit are moved one hex. Okay, so player A will move one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And the Dolan station will move once around the planet. Player A moves his ships, making sure that no ship is... Yes, okay, we've done that. The non-player character, player B announces which of his ships will shoot at moving ships and which weapons they will use. The non-player, the non-moving player then resolves all of these attacks. So, on our frigate and on our assault scout, we're a little bit far away still. What do we got here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hexes away. A hundred thousand kilometers, kids. So, pretty far. Um, if we look at the rules here as to their weapon ranges, the uh, frigate has got a laser cannon, rocket battery, laser battery, and torpedo. And at a range of 10, the only thing that can fire that we've got here is the laser cannon. That's got a range of 10. Uh, oh, wait, the torpedoes? Torpedoes? Oh, no, they're only a range of 4. Wow. And that's MPO means move, moving player only, which means only these guys could launch them. So, uh, we can actually fire the laser cannon, because he's at 10, that's too far away for that guy. He's got assault rockets and a laser battery. Yeah, that's not going to work for the assault scout. And our space station also just has 
a laser battery, and some defenses. So he ain't going to shoot anything, but we're going to have a Zagata fire on the first Sathar ship, the Venomous. Using the advanced rules chart, the laser cannon, and uh, gray is not used in this scenario. Gray is for the basic rules. Laser cannon versus reflective hull has a 60% chance to hit. So basically he's got a 60% chance to hit, but it's also got range diffusion. What is that? That means for every hex you go through, you're going to have to minus 5%. So his 60% chance to hit goes down by 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. So he's only got a 10% chance. It's a pretty long shot. Luckily, though, he does have the ability to, because the Sathar is in the center lane of his forward firing weapon, he's got a head-on shot, which gives him a 10% chance to, or he can add 10% to his chance to hit, which means we are up all the way to 20% chance. Everybody's level three, so our gunner aboard has a plus 15% chance to improve accuracy. So we are up to 35% chance to hit now. And let's roll the dice. 35. Oh, red is always first. 84. So he misses with a actually somewhat considerable chance to have hit there. All right. Uh, assault scout cannot possibly hit, so we move on to the next round, which is that the moving player now attacks the non-moving player. And the SAV Venomous also has a laser cannon, some rocket batteries, which again at this distance are not going to hit, but he does have, oh, he has an electron battery, EB, does an electron battery have that range? I think it does, electron battery has a range of 10, okay, so again, pretty much uh, with the exception of the ability, because the electron battery is not a cannon, it doesn't have forward firing. It doesn't get that plus 10%, but the laser cannon does. So, bit big, easy, quick bit of math there means the Sathar has a 35% chance to hit the frigate with his laser cannon and a 25% chance to hit him with his electron battery. Let's see what happens. So, Sathar, red first. He hits him with his laser cannon, we'll do the damage in a second, and the electron battery with only a 25% chance to hit, red first, he misses. Okay, but the laser cannon strikes. Now, when we are doing damage, the laser cannon will do two, oh, can you see that? No. The laser cannon can do two die ten worth of damage uh, against the hull, and we also roll on this damage table to see what else happens, because sometimes you can knock out systems. A laser cannon does not have a modifier to this roll, so let's see. Without any modifier, let's see what happens when we roll here. 11. 11 means hull hit roll normal damage. Okay, so two die 10 are going to happen against the Zagata. The Zagata currently has 40 hull points, so two die 10 worth of damage to that is... Three whole points of damage. Wow, I think the Zagata will survive. Okay, so that brings Zagata down from 40 to 37. All right. Now the Perdition sees that he's got an Assault Scout coming to him. He's probably going to try and do the exact same thing. He also has the exact same weapons. So he's going to try and hit the Assault Scout, who could evade, but I did not, did, not, did not announce that, so they're just coming straight at him. So for the Perdition to hit the Assault Scout, he's got a 35% chance to hit with the uh, uh, laser cannon. Red first. Zero two, that hits, and we'll do the other one. Oops, I want to knock them out of orbit. Uh, and then a 25% chance to hit with the Electron Battery. 94, misses. Okay, so Here's where we get into that territory that I talked about. Our Assault Scout, our kind of poster child for the Nighthawks campaign. Uh, the one that's on the cover of the book and everything. Uh, it's about to take two of these in its face, and it's only got 15 hull points to begin with. Is it going to be completely wiped out right away? Here we go. 19. Now that's a 10. And that's a 9, so that's 19 points of damage have hit this Assault Scout and immediately destroyed him. 
That's gotta hurt. Uh, whenever you have um, rolled up characters and invested all this time and uh, money and things into your adventuresome ship to be wiped out by simple 19 points, that's painful. That's a lot. And that was sort of my complaint about the game. But, you know, we're still moving forward here. Let's uh, let's see what happens. So, we no longer have an Assault Scout in our group. <clears throat> That's bad. What happens next? All right, so now it's up to the Zagata to win the day. And he's got two untouched Sathar cruisers or destroyers heading at him. I think this is going to be a very short bit of battle here. Um, depending on how this goes, I may actually film another one of these in the future. But anyway, let's let's do this for now. So the Zagata is going to move. I think what he would do, given that he does have an armed space station beside him, he's going to hit the deceleration, which means all of the crew on board are suddenly going to have three Gs or more uh, hitting them <laughs> in the opposite direction from their travel. But regardless. He has a speed of 5, he has an ADF of 3, so that means he can reduce his speed down to a total of 2, and yeah, he's going to do that. He's going to maneuver 3. So, let's go. He's got to move at least 1 there, and then with his speed of 2, he's going to turn once and move there. That's his move. His speed is now 2. Let me just put that in speed. Speed is Two. and I think he's going to shelter himself with the space station keeping him going and I did forget a step actually player A announces which of his ships are going to use masking screens then he moves okay well because I forgot you know what he will engage a masking screen so let's just do that I will put a masking screen counter on top of him so that we know and I will tick the masking screen off his inventory, which all the ships have. One masking screen used. Then he moves, then the space station will orbit again. Let's just put the space station there. And now the non-player character gets to shoot. Well, <laughs> this is not gonna go very well for you, buddy. Let's see, now they are closer. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hexes away. So we are looking at not much of a change. Let's roll. So that has actually not changed anything at all. They've still got the same factors. Okay, so our Sathar will now fire. And they again have a 35% chance. Oh wait, no, now he's got us now he's got a masking screen. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That totally changes things. So masking screen. The laser cannon has gone from a 60% chance down to a 25% chance. And when we take into account those other factors, that means he has zero chance to hit. So actually, he's not even going to bother hitting with the laser. But the ship does have an electron battery, which is still good at 8 range. Because we check that over here. Electron battery, where did you go? Electron battery, range of 10. So it's still within range. So our electron battery still has a chance. Now against the masking screen, it doesn't make any difference at all. No, it makes a little bit of difference. Okay, he's only got a 50% chance to hit. It's got range diffusion. So we subtract 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. So that brings it down to a 10% chance to hit. There are no bonuses for the fact that it has got the forward firing, but he does have a third level crew member on board. So that gives him a 25% chance to hit. Let's give this a whirl. So now, 28. Oh, he just misses. And the Perdition is also going to fire, also with a 25% chance to hit. 27. <laughs> oh, that was close. So yeah, a bunch of electron beams are going to be firing at this ship that is now coasting at a speed of 2 with this crystalline structure around it. And it... Did not hit. Very, very lucky there, buddy. All right. That is the non-player character has now, or non-moving character has now done their attacks. And so now the Sathar become the moving character. And are they going to announce any masking screens? You know what? They're going to go in fairly confident. They've already wiped out one ship. They're not going to bother. They don't want to be reduced by what maneuverability they've got. 
So they're actually just going to go in guns blazing. They're going to keep their speed of five, I think. Um, do I want to increase that? Yeah, no, we'll keep our speed of five. So one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Sorry for the shaky battle mat there. And yeah, again, they have not increased or decreased their speed. They have just maintained. So they're just coasting through space, drifting as it were, but drifting really, really fast. Again, for the ability to pass, travel that amount of space in that short amount of time, I know it's 10 minutes, but that's, that's pretty fast. Oh, let oh, me just adjust the camera here. Okay, so now it's non-player mover character's turn. So this guy and our space station. Now, our space station does have a laser battery, uh, not much else, and it is able to reach a range of nine. I think we might be in nine. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, okay, so the space station's gonna fire his laser battery, but let's start off with the Zagata, which is already in trouble. He is facing this direction now, so his forward firing laser cannon is no good. He would be able to get somebody there or somebody in this column or this column, but none of those guys. He may have made a mistake in deciding to change his direction. However, he has the Venom, Venomous, Venomous, uh, one, two, three, four hexes away, but now he can probably let loose a bit more of his weaponry. He could fire his rocket battery, which has a range of rocket battery, a range of three. No, he can't. He can fire his torpedo, except for the torpedo is moving player only, so that will not work this time. All he can do is fire his laser battery. Wow, okay, so yeah, his laser cannon's no good because it's not. It's only forward firing. Rocket battery is too short of range. Oh, sorry, torpedo can only be used on the moving player only turn, so this is not his, he's not the moving player, he can't fire it. So that means all he's got is his laser battery. All right, so laser battery at a distance of four against just a reflective hull, laser battery against a reflective hull, 50% chance, minus 5, 10, 15, 20, means a 30% chance, plus he's got a third level gunner, so that's a 45% chance. Yeah, that's pretty good. Let's hope for the best here. So blue first. Oh, and don't forget, because he now has a masking screen, lasers shooting out of the masking screen will actually do less damage. It's the disadvantage of having a masking screen in combat. And actually, having just checked the rules again, uh, it says, let me make that up. Um, if a ship surrounded by a masking screen fires its lasers, which is the case here, resolve the attack as if the defending ship is masked. So that changes things. Instead of our 50% against the reflective hull, it's down to a 20% chance because he's firing out of the crystalline structure. So 20% uh, plus his 15 for his third level gunner is 35% chance, but then it's down from 35, 30, 25, 20, 20. He's got a 15% chance. That's still worth it because he's in bad trouble. Okay, 15% chance to hit the Venomous. No good. All right, so lasers fire out of the crystalline structure that is surrounding the frigate and do not hit. And that is the end of that turn. So things have changed radically here. Now we will start a new turn. This time we're going to roll for initiative again. So red for the satire, green for the UPF. It's a tie. We will re-roll. Oh, 10 for the Sathar, one for the UPF. Sathar go again first. I think they're feeling pretty confident. They're not going to engage any masking screens. So that's that part of the step out. Uh, space station's orbit. So this guy is slowly moving away from being very helpful. I think our frigate is in deep trouble now. And player A, which is this guy, is going to move. They have a speed of five. Do I want to keep that going? No. They're both going to decrease their, their speed to three. In fact, let's write that down just in case I forget. Since the frigate, the, the Zagata, has reduced to two, the Venomous could reduce his speed to two, but he's only going to reduce his speed to three. So three for the Venomous, three for the Perdition. 
So they hit the brakes and they only move three, but I think they're just going to keep going in a straight line. One, two, three, one, two, three. A uh, factor that I've mentioned before, but is worth bringing up. So this ship and this ship are just a hex away from each other. You would think it's like in the movies where you can see out the window. Oh my God, there's the bad guy ship. No, that's 10,000 kilometers. That's the size of the planet Earth. So they're not going to be seeing anything out the window. They're only going to be using their instrumentation for this fighting. So now it's combat. The non-moving player is going to fire. And since the space station is close enough now, you darn right he's going to shoot. Um, I guess we'll start with the space station, actually. He has a laser battery. And he is one, two, three, four away, which we know. He does not have a masking screen. His laser battery has a 50% chance to hit the reflective hull of the Sathar, but his 50% chance goes down to 45, 40, 35, 30% chance. He has a third level gunner on board, so that goes back up to 45% chance. That's about it. So, space station going to shoot at the Sathar. Come on, 35%. Yes, 14. All right, we'll do damage in a second. The space, sorry, the frigate, I think he's not showing correctly, he's in that hex right there. Okay, the frigate, um, no, you know what, let's resolve that because then I'll, I might forget. So, laser battery has struck the Sathar destroyer. Laser battery will roll on the advanced damage table. Battery has no modifiers, so let's just see what we get here. Roll high, 64, ooh, weapon hit, okay. With the laser battery, we have managed to wipe out any of these in order. Does the destroyer have a proton battery? No, he doesn't. Does he have an electron battery? Yes, he does. So, the electron battery actually is now destroyed, or it's damaged. The crew on board could try to repair it if they want, but he no longer has his electron battery. Good shooting, Tex. The frigate goes, and he can fire his can his laser cannon at this guy. You're darn right he's gonna. His rocket battery is within range. His laser battery is gonna be kind of gimped, but at least he'll shoot. The torpedo will be movable when he is the moving player. Which, is he now? No, he's not yet. So next round he'll be able to fire his torpedo. So let's actually have him... Yeah, let's have him shoot the laser cannon at this guy. Again, as if he was shooting a guy in a masking screen. So laser cannon against a masking screen has a 25% chance to hit. There is range diffusion, so it goes from 25 to 20 to 15. It's in direct line, so it goes up to 25. He has a third level guy on board, a gunner, so that's up to 40% chance to hit. Let's see how this goes. 40% with the laser cannon into the Sathar Destroyer B, 40%. Yes, he gets them! And you know what? Let's just resolve that damage right now, because if I don't, I don't forget. Okay, laser cannon has no modifier, but we get to roll on the die table, so what do we got? 14 is just a hull hit. Okay, but the Perdition is going to take 2 die 10 of damage, so... Now, the Perdition, unfortunately, has 50 hull points, so I don't think he's going to hurt too much from this, but add him up. Eight points of damage to the Perdition. All right, well, hey, he did something. That's good. And so that is now down to 42, but I don't think this is going to go very well. And now he's going to fire his rocket battery against the Venomous because he really wants to take that guy down. No problems with range diffusion or anything like that. The only problem is it's limited. So let's fire the rocket battery against... The Venomous. Don't have to worry about the uh, reflective screen and the masking screen element here. Sorry, we do have to worry about... Actually, we don't need to worry about the reflective hull, do we? Uh, it'll be taking... There is a reflective hull on the Venomous. Okay. A rocket battery. There we go. It has a 40% chance to hit a reflective hull. It doesn't suffer from any kind of range diffusion. 40%... Where does that go down to? So that's it. Just... Rocket battery, 40%. Oh, and he has a um, third level gunner on board. So that's a 55% for his rocket battery to actually hit the ship. Yeah, okay. The only, only limitation is the range. This is only three, but we're within three. So let's do it. 55% chance to hit the rocket battery for the rocket battery to hit 
The Sathar. Venomous. Oh, 85. Okay. No good. The rockets fly off into space. Do not hit anything. And the Zagata has fired one rocket battery. Okay. And he does have his laser battery as well, which we will fire against the Venomous. Uh, and then he will use his torpedo when he's the moving player. The laser battery has... And it's like it's being hit out of a masking screen, so 20% chance. There is range diffusion, so it's 15%. He's got a third level gunner, so that's up to 30%. And that is it. Okay, 30% chance to hit the Venomous. Go for it, buddy. He misses. Okay, so there goes that one. So that is all that the Zagata can do currently until he's the moving player and he can fire a torpedo. And the Dolan Bay has tried its best to help. So that is combat for those guys. So now the moving player announces what he's going to fire. And he's going to lay into... Should he take out... Hmm, yeah, okay. So yes, the Venomous is going to try and take out the Zagata, seeing that it's already damaged. And what's he got? He's got pretty much everything. He doesn't have his electron battery. Remember that got wiped out. So, he has a laser cannon. Now, just a second. Is that in that cone? I think it is. Oh, no, he can't. He can't. You see? A forward-firing weapon gets to hit there or these hexes, but not these hexes. This guy cannot hit. He can hit these hexes and beyond. He could shoot the space station. In fact, yes, I think he's going to. So, he's going to fire at the space station. And unfortunately, the space station doesn't have a heck of a lot of hit points or hull points. It's got 25, so the Venomous will attack the space station. A laser cannon against laser cannon against a reflective hull, 60%, but there's range diffusion, so it goes down to six, 55, 50, 45, 40%. He's got a third level gunner, so that's 55% chance, and that's about it. Okay, 55% chance. Come on. Hit the Dolan Bay. He hits him. He gets him. So the Dolan Bay space station is going to... Oh, wait, wait, wait. We roll on the table. 12. Just normal damage. Okay. So the space station takes two of these. <gasps> oh, double zeros. That's bad. That's a maximum of 10 on a die 10. So... The space station has gone from 20 hull points, sorry, 25 hull points to 5. This is going to go badly, very, very badly indeed. Oh, geez. Okay, and that's one shot. All right, then the Sathar is going to use his rocket battery against the um, Zagata, firing a... Rocket battery against a masking screen is a 40% chance. He's got a third level gunner, so that's 55% chance. That's about it. Okay, Zagata's in trouble. 55% chance here. 06. He gets him. On the rocket battery, we got a minus 10 on this roll here. So minus 10 is 41, so that's a regular old damage. And regular old damage from a rocket battery is 2 die 10. I think the Zagata's in trouble. The Zagata has currently, well, he's got 37 hull points. He, he might be okay. But 2 die 10 will knock him down to 16. Oh, wow. Okay, so 16 from 37. That's 21. He is below half. Oh, no, sorry, no. He's not below half yet. He's at half. 21. Oh, and this guy's gone. And this guy's not going to be around for much longer. Okay. So, boy, the Sathar just wiping the floor. And this was without having a heavy cruiser in it. That's the rocket battery. Oh, sorry. I have to mark that a rocket battery salvo was fired. Laser battery. If I was a Sathar, I was going to shoot. You know what? He's got a very badly wounded space station and a guy in a masking screen he's obviously going to go for the space station so the space station i mean not that he can see any of this but for the sake of gameplay here i'm just speeding things along laser battery against a reflective hull has a 50 percent chance to hit but that goes down from 50 to 45 40 35 30 he's got a third level gunner so that's back up to 45 
Yeah, let's give it a shot. 45% chance to hit the space station. 32, he hits him. And let's just see what happens because... This might be the end of the space station. So uh, on the advanced table, we roll a 97. Wow. No modifier. 97. Navigation hit. Hmm. Well, you can't navigate a space station. So when these are non-applicable, it counts as just hull damage. Navigation hit. See, you get some really nasty stuff in the upper levels here. All right. So the space station is going to take... One die roll, and he's only got five hull points left. If this is more than a five, the space station's gone. Seven. Kablooey. That is the end of the space station. Oh, man. The Sathar are really kicking butt. Is it any wonder I haven't had them show up in my uh, discussions yet? <laughs> Jeez. Okay. And that's not even him finished yet. He has still got a torpedo, and he's the moving player. He's going to fire it at the Zagata. So the torpedo is going to be... Where are we at here? Torpedo against a masking screen is a 50% chance to hit. Torpedo doesn't have... It's a moving player only and it's limited and we're within range. That's about it. So we've got a raw... Where'd torpedo go? 50% chance to hit with a third level gunner. 65% chance to hit here. I think we're going to have a go. So 65% chance to hit the Zagata. 37, that hits. And let's just resolve. The torpedo gets a minus 20 off the modifier here. So minus 20 from 22 is 0 to double damage. Double damage. Yikes. Because the torpedo does 4 die 10. Ouch. I'm going to roll this twice, I'm going to add it all up, and then I'm going to double it, and that's what the Zagat is going to get with his measly 21 hit points left, hull points. Okay, so, first roll, we have seven, five and two. Second roll, we have five, so that's 12, so that's 24 points of damage to the Zagata with one torpedo hit. And unfortunately, that has wiped out the Zagata. Destroyed. Boom. And the Sathar go on and invade Kenza Kit, I suppose. So that's a rapid <laughs> deployment of what happens in the spaceship combat. And it's really cool. I do like the fact that we've got masking screens, electron batteries. There's a whole element to the combat I didn't go into because, again, this was going to be a long video to begin with, and it has ended up being so. But you get a, the general gist of how spaceship combat works. What I like is the fact that it's so based on reality. Like, you've got, with these rules, you've got really cool technology in place. You've got a neat sense of, like... I can't turn my ship around fast enough, like capital ship combat, kind of like the sort of thing you'd see in Star Trek. But it's also got fighters and assault craft, like their assault scouts. A pseudo Millennium Falcon uh, X Wing fighter kind of combat is also possible here. All played out on a map that is scientifically accurate. I mean, that's how big the Earth is. And it really makes you think, like, these things are just cruising along at, in space. I, <sighs> What can I say? I, I, I really was impressed and happy about that. Now, what I'm not happy about is my poor players, who may have bought themselves or somehow got themselves an assault scout and a frigate, have easily been wiped out in, what was that, three rounds or something? Like, the, the rule set is kind of designed almost with the idea of very quick and easy and brief rules for combat and unfortunately that's not what you want when you see these pictures you don't want something where you your ship only has 15 hull points how the heck are you supposed to survive more than a couple of rounds of combat with only 15 especially with torpedoes and assault rockets and all manner of other kinds of ship uh, combat weapons here that i haven't even touched on However, that is Nighthawks in a nutshell. Uh, I hope you like that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a much shorter session than, than the one we did where we were uh, attacked on the planet. But 
this is also why we didn't really get to play too much of it back in my campaign back in the day. It's it's clunky and it doesn't lend itself well to high adventure concepts that I think players have when they jump aboard their assault craft and they're going to different planets. They're thinking, oh yeah, my ship can take on a, a beating. It can go through multiple battles. No, it can't. Not according to these rules. Lots of people have modified these rules over the years and I think they've done a good job. I personally would have all... I have a whole bunch of um, house rules myself for what I was doing if we ever got to combat, but unfortunately it took so darn long to get to that stage of getting onto a spaceship and having the skill to fly it and shoot its weapons and things. It it didn't lend itself well to being to appearing a lot in my campaign. Maybe it appears a lot in your campaign. All right, I'm going to end this video here, so until next time, we'll see you down the rabbit hole.